I, well, I, this I, is fun. We have four pages. Four. I have to click click to see you all four times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you, most of you are not on camera. Seven, no. Seventy-six participants, and I must say I'm very happy. And I was really excited when Peter told me that he talked to you and you will join us because uh, actually you're one of my youth heroes. Uh, writing this and the starting force book, of course. So this is the original one I got some 30 years ago and uh, it really has content that was amazing. And I think it's still relevant today. And the artwork that is in starting force and also in thinking force uh, really, uh, uh, yeah, was uh, partnering my whole life. And I was came up with your drawings um, again and again. Uh, uh, to illustrate also talks of myself. So I'm very, very happy to uh, listen uh, to what you want to say to us today and also happy to uh, be able to ask you some questions afterwards. Great, yeah, I'd be happy to. It's, uh, it's I, really I, nice. may, may I propose um, Ulrich <coughs> and Leo, uh, we have people very late in the night in Asia. If we start with them and then we go over to Europe and then of, to the of other. Of course, of course. Who, who is in Australia? Is John Hardy uh, in the meeting? Or Rob, do you have any questions? Rob, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, no questions at all. I'd just uh, like to welcome you, Leo. Um, you're, uh, as uh, you were just told, uh, you're one of my heroes as well. Uh, you told me everything I know about four. So um, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Rob. Um, I'm in the meeting as well. It's John Hardy from Melbourne, <laughs> oh, hi, Australia. And yeah, I, I first read your book in the early 80s, uh, the, uh, starting forth. Um, and it influenced me quite a bit because I realized when I did some, mag I, I published a few articles in local magazines and they had a lot of cartoons in it and i was going gee there <laughs> there's a lot of leo brody in there <laughs> when i looked at them recently i thought this is very much influenced by your style um but yeah it was just something that uh it suddenly occurred to me when i was looking back through your i was rereading your book and uh it was uh, just something that popped out well that's fun but, uh, thanks and welcome to the group yeah, yeah. thank you you're muted peter uh can you hear me guys now Hello? yes yes we hear you yeah what are you hello doing? just yeah uh, my name is constantine just wanted to tell you that i'm one of those guys who bought your book in soviet union with a russian translation oh i'm so <laughs> glad to, to to, to meet you here today, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. I didn't hear what you said. You're one of those people who bought my book. Say it in again. Russian in Soviet Union. Oh, in, in oh Russia. yeah. Wow, in late, cool. Late eighties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you. that was fun to see to see it translated you can, into you Russian. You can see even how it looked like in Soviet Union. <laughs> it was. I, it's, I it's have all Soviet. <laughs> I got a copy of that, which is really oh, fun. Yeah. So it was yeah. official publishing. Uh, it was, I guess, an official translation into Russian. So it, it, I bought it in a regular store, bookstore. So. Mm. Yeah, that's just amazing to me. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, okay. this is the starting yep. in Chinese. I remember <laughs> that. I remember that, Dr. Ting. Thank you. Do Dr. Cheng, where are you? Say hello to our friend here. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ching, Cheng, uh, King? Here. Uh, oh, it's very late in Taiwan here, but the, I think it's the first army here. Uh, because the I'm retired for six or six years, six and a half years. So I'm now just retired for good. So all the time is the in uh, in home, just uh, missing the some the good old days with the boss, because the you know the Doctor Tings he's the teach us the force in the Taiwan. 
So we, in the Taiwan, we call it the father of, of the force in, the, in here. Uh, by the way, the, we also just get the, the force, the knowledge is from the, his book. He write a lot of notes. Uh, in the Taiwan, we, I think the, the fake Taiwan have the one good benefit is the hardware because the, here is the island of the silicon. So we have a lot of chance to can make the very cheap. Cheap is cheap. So it's in here. Uh, I'll just give, a, give you an example. If you just want to make a 90 nanometer uh, chip in the six inch uh, weapon, now you just uh, maybe just need to mm, Three, that's thirty thousand US dollars. You can make the weather, uh, and you can get the every slice. Just have the three hundred dollars, and every slice maybe you can cost the uh, by uh, I think fifty thousand or the sixty thousand chips. Of course, you have to pass the, the package or the and some the testing, but it's mean the uh, force is never have been to be a virtual machine anymore, because now we have a chance can make it be a real machine in the low low power and uh, good efficiency and in. The, the better way is the force is the interactive language. Or that we can call it the all-in-one system. You don't have to just put it on the Linux or to put it on the uh, big, the, like the window or the Mac. That's kind of the, uh, the mm, huge operating system. If just can do this uh, AIoT, or artificial intelligence, the uh, uh, internet of things, so the, in this kind of the project, maybe we can have this chance use the small chip uh, with the, the force inside. It's a good idea to do that. The second thing is the, how to teach the force. It's, the, it's something that just confused us the, for the, maybe over the 20 or 30 years, because the, a lot of the, I think the, a lot of professors try to teach the force in, the, in their school. In, the, in their the class. But it's not easy to successful because when you want to uh, explain the, so, the force with the assembly, that assembly is not force. Uh, like the, you, the, the 80, 8086 or the- uh, Okay, Dr. Dr. King, we continue so, with Jason in Malaysia. Jason, okay. are you there? Thank you for your talk. Okay. Thank you, Jason. You are mute. You are muted, uh, Jason. Unmute, please. You are muted. Okay, next one. In, uh, is someone else in Asia who wants to say hello to Leo? Yes, sir. So do you hear me, sir? Yes. Okay. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. I'm very appreciate to meeting you in the meeting. Yes. Are you and you're in Asia? Uh, actually, I am from Laos and I live in Asia. But right now I'm continue to study the master in the Philippines. I'm doing about the mechatronics. Oh, good. Welcome. Well, is somebody in Russia? Is Ilya? Ilya, are you in the meeting? Do you want to say hello to Leo? <laughs> hello. 
Can Hello, you hear me? Yeah. Yes, hi. Yes, uh, I'm prepared uh, some uh, kind of material to continue our lessons about uh, Fort uh, writing. Okay. Uh, last time, uh, nobody knows from where I am. So, uh, and I check my home. Sorry, no vodka. So I cannot put it uh, at the background. So I am from Russia. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, I still not sure. Uh, uh, I will uh, uh, tell something today. No, only, but... only say hi, hi to the group, no? Okay. Say hi to... Okay, so uh, I can say hi, and uh, I will add uh, at my lecture starting fort, thinking fort, writing fort. Okay, writing fort. good. Well, uh, so I think uh, it's time, Ulrich. Uh, um, do you want we start with some questions? I, I talked with Leo to make a kind of interview. We are talking with him and he will tell us about the, mm -hmm. the story, the history, how he created his wonderful uh, books. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, right. So, so we were always wondering, I learned you originally have been a puppeteer. And uh, so at least in a German setup, it would be very unusual that a puppeteer would do any technical work. And so yeah, we would very much learn about uh, how you came to Force Force Inc. and how you, in the end, uh, wrote these amazing books, like this is the German translation of Starting Force. And uh, so I have, I have both the German and the English copies. And uh, so how, how did it all become? Uh, come into existence yeah I, I think you're going to ask ask me those questions Peter I won't but that's something we want to I think that'd be fun to talk about yes yeah. okay Leo how how was your, the start uh, of your career uh, with force how how did you enter in contact with force okay um well it I really was lucky. I kind of fell into it. I didn't. I didn't plan this, um, but um, I had. Uh, this was back in the late '70s, and um, my then my first wife was pregnant, and she said to me, "You know, because I had been sort of doing odd jobs and still wanting to be a. I wanted to be a comedy writer, <laughs> actually, and I was also writing songs. But she said, "You need to get a real job um, if you have a family to support." So I thought, okay, well, um, I noticed that there were ads in the newspaper for programmers and I didn't know programming at all, um, but it seemed kind of fun. So I, I just got a bunch of books and I didn't really know the, didn't know the difference between just digital electronics, which I studied for a while, which was actually useful to know um, <clears throat> and building little things with, just IC circuits, you know, and and or gates and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and then microprocessors, and then these big mainframes. So um, and you know, mainframes were like you couldn't you couldn't get near one. Well, uh, I ended up um, um, I had a job. It was actually a job in Beverly Hills, California, at a, in an office doing sort of uh, administrative work. And every lunch break, I would go over to a Radio Shack store. So it's a, it's an electronics retailer in, in this country. And uh, they created a, a computer uh, called the, the um, called the TRS-80. I can actually share my screen and pull that up. Boom, that's it there. <laughs> Some of you know that, whoops, go there. Wait a minute. Why is it not coming up? Oh, I see. There, remember that? So that at the store, they had basic on it. And um, so I, and there was a book next to it and I, I learned, um, oops, wait a minute, I gotta unshare. I'm not very good at this, am I? Oh, I'm trying to unshare my screen now. So 
sorry. <laughs> Am I sharing the screen or not? Yes, yes. I, we, yes, you are. yes, we see it. And we see a small tr Okay, I, I don't I know why. Oh, it's over on the other page. I'm sorry. Um, I have two screens. That, that confused me. Anyway, uh, so I, I taught myself basic. And I thought it was pretty fun. Uh, uh, and... Um, and then I ended up getting a, um, a small uh, uh, learning circuit board with a, a microprocessor on it that Texas Instrument made. And um, I think I have a picture of that too, if I can risk um, sharing my screen again. There we go, screen two, boom. And I'm gonna open it up. this one. This one. Okay, so this is just really uh, a single board computer. It had the, uh, the chip on it. And they had one a Texas instrument calculator face glued to the front of the board, so that I could enter the instructions. And that's me <laughs> uh, playing with this thing back in like 1979. And so I wrote a couple assembler programs on that. Um, one was actually, it played uh, Christmas carols, uh, a couple of Christmas carols, um, using that little speaker that you see on there on the, on the face of it. And the other one was kind of a little check, check register um, entry thing. Uh, Leo, could you make the picture a bit larger uh, in the middle? Um, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, let's see, how do I do that? You wanna see that board? Click slideshow um, current. Slideshow at the top. Okay. The top. Okay. I was. I thought I was in the. Um, I see what you mean, though. Okay. I'm not That's sharing my screen, though. Though now, am I? No. No. Not no. Yet. No. Okay. Let me do that again. <laughs> so it should be. Well, do I want screen two or do I want? Ah. Yeah, I think you were sharing your PowerPoint window instead of your presentation screen. Okay, what are you seeing now? Yeah, the uh, 9900. The PowerPoint yeah. window. Yeah, yeah. much better, much better. Okay. Yeah, there you go. That's it. So that was kind of fun. I spent a lot of time uh, playing around with that. So anyway, I um, uh, I did those programs, and then I realized I couldn't get. First of all, nobody was using that, at least not in the area that I lived, um, and um, so I couldn't I couldn't find any work doing that. And also, I had never been a programmer, so I had no experience. But I had been a copywriter for an advertising agency. I did that for a few years. And I, I really learned to write well there when you're writing marketing materials. Um, my, my editor was just excellent. He just, it's, it's kind of fun because I would write what I thought was a great paragraph and he would chop out 60%, he would chop out 40% of the words and make it really stronger um, and, and clearer. So it, he taught me to write really well. So I decided I'd be a technical writer, use my, limited programming knowledge and, and uh, do that. So I saw a job for a technical writer and it was at Fourth Inc. And I didn't know anything about Fourth at the time, but I went down, interviewed with Elizabeth Rather and uh, showed her my little computer board and the applications and showed her some of my writing and I got the job. And so I just lucked into that. And so my when, when I was there, I was writing, um, they had already written I think Elizabeth mostly wrote a book called Using Forth. And uh, it was meant for technical people. And I, I sort of managed, I maintained that document for quite a while, like adding stuff to it and editing it and maintaining it and updating it. Then Elizabeth asked me to write a beginner book um, so that you wouldn't have to know programming already when you read this book. And um, I remembered when I was in that store learning 
to use the learning to use basic on the uh, on the radio shack on the TRS-80 and they had on the table they had the computer uh, on a table where you could just sit down and use it and they had a book and I can't find the book now but it was a it was a I, th I think it was yellow uh, I don't know it was um, it was a beginner book on basic and it had cartoons in it they weren't cartoons oh. that they weren't oh. there's a couple of them but it it didn't use the cartoons the cartoons were there just to kind of make you feel comfortable they weren't um they weren't illustrating loops or anything like that they were just like oh here's a guy sitting at his computer with his cup of coffee and it's just kind of make you feel it was so really informal and i love the fact that it was written in this real friendly language and so i thought of that immediately when uh, elizabeth Elizabeth asked me to write this book. And so I started taking what I knew and I had access to Chuck and I had access to all these other programmers. I didn't have much access to Chuck, but he was there if I needed him. But I, I didn't need it really because I was doing beginning stuff and <clears throat> all these other programmers were there in Elizabeth. And so I, it was great to have access to that. And they gave me some you know, simple examples. And so my job was really to try to figure out how to, what's the order that I put all this information in so that it's presented one idea at a time. The other thing that happened, which is kind of fun, there was a programmer there named Mike Lamana, um, who was a really great guy. Um, uh, and he said to me, you know what, I've always thought that, I thought that fourth would be best, the best way to explain fourth would be with cartoons. And, and I thought, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Now I found out later that what he meant was anim animated cartoons like films that would show the movements of things like that. But, but I just was, I just thought like, like a drawing, cartoon drawings. And so um, that's kind of what gave me the idea to illustrate the, the movements because fourth is so, when I'm doing fourth, I remember you have to visualize what's going on because you can't see what's going on. You have to have this mental idea of like keeping track of what's on the stack you know, you have to do that in your head. And then you have to just imagine all these data structures and things happening and the, what's the interpreter doing. And so I just thought it would be fun to illustrate all of those things with little characters. And um, so that's how that came to be. You answered my, my next question. <laughs> this is the key, the key of the success of your book. This is the key. You're right. Well, we, all it, we all love your creativity. It's in fantastic, Leo. Thank you. Well, it was just a way to explain the ideas, um, uh, you know. How, and, how, and I, go how ahead. Did you come up with the characters. I mean, the interpreter. It's 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 really a character that uh, we know, or the executor. Uh, did did he sit down and said, "Okay, let's"? Uh, or did, how does it come to your mind? <laughs> well, I think you know. It's, it's funny. I think I was looking through. I was looking through this just last night, which I don't normally read. I haven't read it for a long time, but I was just flipping through it and I was looking at the cartoons and I'm, I actually am answering your question, but uh, most of the cartoons are based on some kind of wordplay. Um, so like, like I think Peter posted the one about, oh no, he didn't post it. He, he posted a different yes. one, but, um, but I was flipping through it and there's one where where all these, they look like they're kind of drunk, all these programmers. They're at, like at a party and they're dancing with each other and they're holding, they're holding drinks and stuff like that. And one of them says, you know, I don't, I don't really see how these, these programming conventions improve readability. And, and I realized the joke there is just a wordplay on programming conventions, meaning like how you write your code and how you indent and stuff like that. But I was interpreting it as, Oh, it's like a trade convention where everybody goes and shows up and has parties. <laughs> so to answer your question, Rick, when I'm thinking of an interpreter, you know, there's, that's a profession, you know, and there are people who, who, who are interpreters. In fact, I have a friend who's a Japanese interpreter. Um, and so um, I just pictured, I pictured a kind of a guy who would be like, who would be at, you know, at the embassy you know, very formal kind of almost like a butler, you know, so he's dressed with his little bow tie. Yeah. So he's very, and he's very precise, you know, and he's just, he's just l looking up the words. And then of course, execute, well, you know, he's going to be a, 
he's going to be an executioner from medieval England. <laughs> excellent, <laughs> you know? excellent. And the, and the, um, the compiler also, a, a monk. Monk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The compiler, right? Because the monk writes this, writes this, <laughs> the scrolls. So it's all verbal uh, wordplay, and I don't know if it translates well. Um, and then there's one other thing in fourth. It's a little embarrassing because back in those days, you know, I wasn't aware of uh, white privilege or you know, like be. I wasn't aware how white everything is in my in my world in those books um, culturally. But there was a show at the time on Saturday Night Live, and I was a big fan of it. Um, and John Belushi had this character where he would come on and play um, a samurai. Oh. Yeah, who, who, yeah. So, so, and he would just like go into a hamburger place and they wouldn't have the hamburger he wanted. And he would just go into a, 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 like a samurai rage where he would be tearing everything up with a sword, like a, like a, Kurosawa movie or something like that. So, <laughs> so we had this. I forget what character he plays, but he's um, he, he's the uh, he's the actual guy behind the counter delivering the food to the customers. Well, and yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. But in the book, what does he do? He oh, he's he's like he's he divide. um he's divided divide yeah. modulus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So he's chopping things up in, in half. And I and I, you know, in, in, in retrospect, I, you know, I was really just copying the John Belushi character. Yep, there he is. And I hope it wasn't offensive to to uh, anybody. But I think I think I sort of I don't it, think to so. me, it wasn't it wasn't intended to be a, you know, a racist thing. It was just mm -hmm. it was just based on this television character, which nowadays might be considered racist. I don't know. And but anyway. That was the origin of all the all the characters. The Swap Dragon is the most famous one because are you aware that there's a an award from the German yes. Force community that and we have a bronze uh, uh, figure of the yeah. Swap Dragon. You guys gave me a pin, right? Of the, exactly. of the Swap Dragon. So so it's, it's really very cool. famous. So it's it's some something like our our pet. Uh, and that's uh, passed around from person to person every year. And uh, so, uh, the swap the same, or is there a, sto a story uh, behind swap as well? What do you mean? So how did you invent swap? Man. I was looking something up here. I, I just wanted to show you. Well, it's kind, sure. of, it's kind of off topic, but. Um, <laughs> Let me go back. What was your question? Did I invent? Um, how how did you invent swap, the the dragon that uh, oh, swaps? How do I invent swap? I don't I don't remember. But but it's like <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna. I wanted to show the movement, right? You have these two okay. things, and you pick one up. Yeah, you, you have to pick one up so you can pick the other one up and put the first one down. Yeah. So okay. it was like, well, what would do that? I don't know. I don't know how I came up with that. <laughs> I was probably running out of ideas. <laughs> yeah. So now, now, now he's alive and he will be. Thank you very much for inventing. Well, let me show you one more thing because this is kind of fun. I don't ever get to talk about this stuff, right? Because none of none of the people that I know in my world know that I've even written these books. So it's, this is kind of fun for me. So, and if you'll indulge me for a second, I when I was writing, uh, when I was writing, starting fourth, I was working at Fourth Inc. So I, I did it as an employee. Um, of the company. And um, I didn't consider myself an artist. I, I could sketch drawings and sort of, you know, I mean, I loved cartoons when I was growing up. I really did. Uh, but I wasn't, I didn't consider myself a great artist. So I initially sought, I looked for someone to illustrate the, the cartoons. And I had the, I had the pencil drawings and the characters are already drawn out in sketches. But I was looking for a real artist. And I happened to have gone to high school with a guy who ended up working at Walt Disney as an animator. So mm -hmm. I, I, I got hold of him and asked if he could do it. And he recommended this other guy. And so this is what came back. Let's see. Um, if you can see that. Let me go like that. So this is the interpreter and the executor guy. Now look at how beautiful these drawings are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. uh, I, I was kind of blown away. And the, the only reason 
I didn't hire him to do them is because they look just like Disney cartoons. You know, I didn't want it to look like a like a Disney book. And but they're so gorgeous. He added I mean, he added so much personality that I I didn't have in my drawings, but um, I just decided not to do it. And he's, he went on, he spent, this guy who did this, his name is Ed Gombert. I never met him, but he went on to do his whole career at, at Disney and Disney animation, which I find kind of amazing. But so I ended up not being satisfied with any of the drawings that any of the people that did it. It's just like they didn't, they didn't, they were, they were either too, too, uh, stylized in a particular way that just see me was distracting i didn't want it to be distracting i just wanted it to be hey okay here's a here's here's a guy you know it's just really simple straight straight to the point so i ended up drawing it myself <laughs> and i think i did a pretty good job and, as it turned yeah, out yeah they look artistic yes they do um we have a question here from matthias koch from germany leo for you yeah. are you still a puppeteer no, um, no, I, I hadn't been a puppeteer. I, I had, I had not been a puppeteer until the late eighties. So I had, I had written both books, uh, starting forth and thinking forth long before I got into puppetry. Um, and it was just, I was, I just loved, um, the Muppets and Jim Henson's work with Sesame street and I decided I, I wanted to do that. And I just, I just it's just, a, it was a new thing for me. And I ended up doing a lot of work for companies that wanted to do either, either uh, corporations that either had events or they wanted to make videos. Um, so it was, again, it was kind of like technical training or not necessarily technical, but just corporate training. And I just really had fun with that. But um, that Ben Ullman in general. You, Ben, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you have a question? No, not really a question, but a big thank you for steering basically a big part of my career into computer science. Your book really always inspired me, and somehow, unfortunately, I lost my original version and had to buy uh, the new the newly typeset book, which was uh, typeset in LaTeX, but I still love uh, thinking forth. And it's one of the books I still recommend to all of my students because it teaches so much more than just programming in forth. It teaches a completely different mindset of programming than what is typically told in universities. So a very, very big thank you from my side and from Germany for your great work. You're welcome. Boy, that's quite the setup you've got behind you there. That's <laughs> you could you could spend an hour walking through what all that stuff is back there. That's fun. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Yeah, I, I also wanted to thank you for uh, thinking forth. I think that that was uh, it was it was like to me, it was just like opening lights. I don't know how to describe it. You know, uh, I'd already been programming in forth for a while, uh, but but once I went through thinking forth, it was just like a, like a, like a, like a whole new way of, of dealing with the world. It uh, definitely changed things quickly. Cool. Yeah. yeah I think that, so, yeah, so I wrote starting forth while I was at forth incorporated as an employee and, uh, and, and I was really delighted at the opportunity and it sold quite a number of books, I guess when it was originally published. And um, so I didn't get royalties from it because I made my income from the salary. <laughs> I was paid to write the book. Um, so when I left Fourth Inc, I wanted to do another book. And I thought, um, I really thought that there needed to be something not about the, the technology of, of writing the language, but the philosophy of it. Like, because it was so, it's so different how, how like Chuck and the other programmers would, would think about a problem. And so I researched it a little bit and um, I, I read uh, some very, and I talked about it in the book, a guy named Parnas, I can't remember his first name right now, wrote some papers about um, really the idea of encapsulation 
And, and that to me is such a key idea. And this was really before object-oriented programming became a thing, but he, his work influenced that. But I think that the, the things he was talking about are um, just, I have found that in my own programming. It's so important to keep everything that's sort of related in one area of your code. And, and, and uh, so that if, if that something changes, like changes with the hardware, well, all those changes are in that little one area and you can just substitute out a different section of code or you can make the changes in that one thing rather than having everything spread out all over the place. Um, and I, I just refer to that as encapsulation. That's one of the key ideas. And, and I just thought, okay, that was a really, to me, that was really um, a pivotal kind of idea. And I wanted to incorporate those ideas, even though they didn't really come from, I, I don't think I ever heard Chuck really say that word but he did talk about things like refactoring and things like that so um then i spent a guy spent uh, at least a year writing that book and, and a lot of those phone calls that i made with people and recorded you know talking to these programmers about how they did it and I, it was just uh, uh i was just tapping other people's brains and i had chuck that i interviewed in person uh for on like at least three occasions for hours um so it was really cool. I was very, very pleased with it. I'm curious if you can say more about that process. One of the most fascinating parts of the Thinking Forth is the, those interviews. With you, so these were done over the phone or in, largely in person? And how did you, you recorded them? And how did that work? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, they were all done over the phone, um, except for Chuck, because I was, in, I was living in the LA area at the time. Um, so I actually had him in person. And um, this is a little embarrassing. You guys are probably, I'm gonna probably regret saying this, but at the time I had a, v, I had a VHS camera uh, and I recorded them onto VH, I recorded these interviews with Chuck onto VHS tape, but I used the, because I knew we were gonna do it for hours. And for some reason I was too cheap to, you want to use a lot of tape, I put the recorder on the, they call it the uh, L long play or LP setting, which means you get six hours on one VHS tape. And, but it doesn't play back very well. And so I never really got good playback. And, you know, <laughs> it's just like, I've always thought someday I should, and now we have YouTube and you can put hours of stuff up, up on YouTube. And I, I just like, like, I don't want to have to go through the trouble of trying to make that work but it would be kind of interesting. And also he was just, you know, he was just speaking off the top of his head. So I took, you know, I list, I played it back and listened to it and kind of condensed it and got it just like the pithy parts in little, in little sections. And, you know, I thought, I thought it came out really well with, in the book form. Does that answer your question, Brad? Yes. Yes. That's a, thank you. Um, I, w I wanted to say um, before, can you listen to me? Yes, I can hear you. Create DAS is object-oriented programming, and this was said much earlier uh, by, by force than in any other language, no? Does anybody use that, Create DAS? I, I know I, I, I kind of use it for some things, yes? That's kind of amazing. <laughs> that's really, I think, my only contribution. Uh, that's really the only contribution I think I made to the fourth community other than the books. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of, I mean, in terms of uh, code that uh, has sort of um, lived on. It's okay, kind of it It's amazing. It's simply amazing. Yeah, but of course, uh, built thus was also uh, there. So, in fact, the concept uh, originates probably from uh, Chuck Moore himself, I think. So it was called Build, build Does? Build, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, it, it's kind of a, an object programming system where you have uh, one uh, data and just one method, uh, default method. And I use that to explain uh, builds DAS or create DAS in uh, the T4th manual. Because uh, 
for modern people, I think it helps to understand what is the value of fourth. Because, um, yeah, and I, I use uh, uh, create does also for implementing uh, classes and objects. And uh, probably everybody who uses classes in fourth does it that way. Interesting. Yeah, cool. So, um, so yeah, so what, first of all, I want to do a little plug because this book is in print, thanks to a team of, team of people, uh, including John Hogger use, if, if he's on the call, I don't think he is, I don't see him. But anyway, they, they, um, they put it in the, they, he wrote to me and asked, this was in the mid 90s, they wanted to be able to put it, they wanted to be able to reconstruct uh, the book as a PDF and put it online for free. And I, I held the rights to it. So he asked if I would put it under a Creative Commons license, which meant that I would retain the, the rights to it, but I would allow anybody to copy it for free. And I thought, well, that's cool because it was out of print. Nobody was gonna publish it at that time. Uh, and but people, it could live on, you know, and that to me was really, really a great thing. And so it went on, um, it went up, I guess it's still available because people are still downloading it. It's probably been downloaded, I don't know how many times. But the other cool thing was because they produced the PDF, I was able to take that since I still had the rights to it um, and add a cover to it and then um, publish it using uh, uh, a company that does instant printing. So this, this, this book is, if when you work, they don't have these in a warehouse anywhere. If you order one from amazon.com or from any bookseller, they'll, the order will go to the company that, that prints it they, and they make them one at a time. And I just think that's a fantastic way for old books to have new life. And, um, and so you can, I still, people still buy them every once in a while they come in kind of a slew of maybe you know eight or ten i think it's must be someone teaching a, a course some teacher assigns the book and so the, it gets a, a, a an order of you know <laughs> more than one or two a month we, uh, leo I, I want to say you something i was almost expulsed uh, expelled from the false community because i was sharing p uh, public domain uh, documents which uh, people need for learning force and I had a terrible, a terrible experience with the guy who put everything in his copyright. And I think, I think this is absurd for the community. So I thank you so much for what you did for Force. And I regret so much this people is, this man is still doing what he did with the copyright. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, uh... I just thought it was an, I, I, I really appreciated the guy who suggested it to me. I had never heard of Creative Commons, but since it wasn't, since nobody was benefiting from the book, um, other than the people who already had copies of it, it just, it just made sense. But I also liked the idea that I could still, I make a little tiny bit of money from the, the sale of the book, which is fair. If people want a hardback, real, not hardback, but it's not a hardback, it's trade publication but if they want the physical book then they can buy it and i think it works out great very happy about that and what i'm doing now mostly is music um so i perform and and i have an album that's that's something that i'd really recommend is that you check out my first instrumental album it's called across the years um and uh and you can buy it it's on you can buy digital versions of it and stuff like that it's sold everywhere. And I'm, I, I think it's really great music. <laughs> well, we will listen to it, of course. We love, we love all you do. You are a great artist, Leo. You have, you have born with this uh, fantastic, incredible mind and, and heart and mm -hmm. your heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. So this brings me to a more general question, which yeah. is since you're artist on the one hand and technical writer on the other hand um, how do you think is there a good relation between art and technology does it need to go hand in hand or uh, so so uh, 
Well, I, I, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think programming, I'm doing a lot of programming right now, actually, for my, for the company, uh, which is my wife's company. And I'm, and I've, for the last couple of months, I've just been really like doing 12 hour days, um, uh, just trying to, and it's all web based, it's web based uh, learning tools. So um, I'm programming in PHP. But to me, it's the programming is extremely creative. Um, you know, it's 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 technical, yes, but it's also really creative because you're inventing stuff. You're, I mean, you have to use your imagination to picture. Well, what's this thing going to look like? I mean, that's there's, there's nothing more creative than that. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it's the same as writing a play or writing a, a making a painting or something like that. You have to have a some kind of sense of what it is you're going for and then you have to figure out well how do i do it and all art involves technology really you know whatever whatever it is whether it's playing the piano or whether it's ma making an oil canvas you have to learn the technology in order to be able to do it but you also have to have the heart you know the like the what's the what's the feeling that you want to and and i i, I really think that even even code applications have um um, I wouldn't say a personality, but they they have a uh, they have a character. You know, you interact with something. When you interact with a computer, you're interacting with something that gives you a sense of it, kind of almost a personality. I guess you could say they are a form of mind. Yeah. Yeah, we experience this often. If you read source code of some person, then you know, okay. This is this. It's his style, and you you know, recognize this choosing of the of the word of the word names or variable names or function names, and uh, also the formatting uh, is something very personal. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. Yeah, I, yeah. I would just like to say that I totally uh, agree with that, Leah. But um, there was one piece of code I had to work with a couple of years ago, five years ago now, that was so awful. It used to make me feel ill reading it. But also, I found pieces of code, particularly from Chuck, that make me feel really happy. I think, wow. So yeah, the, 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 there's much more to this than just technical things. It's the, There is a feeling to it as well. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Th 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 thanks very much, by the way, for starting forth. That's one of my first fourth books. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say something about Chuck more because um, I didn't really, I didn't really consider him like a, a friend, you know, like, uh, but he, he was certainly in the circle and there would be parties and stuff like that. So I got to be over at his house for parties with the, the company was invited and the employees were invited and that kind of thing. And, and I also got to have some, you know, conversations where, where, you know, he showed me what he was doing so that I could write about it in, when I was an employee. And then later, you know, with the interviews and stuff like that. And um, he's a very sweet man, very gentle man, and, um, and just really brilliant. And watching him work and listening to him talk, the thing that struck me the most <clears throat> about him is that he just does, was not concerned about what other people thought about how something should be done. It was just of no interest to him. What was interesting to him was, well, what's the best way to do this? And, you know, and it was, and it was really, what's the best way to do this for me? So, you know, <laughs> and I, I uh, and so what he comes up with, the, the, his solutions are completely unconstrained by conventional wisdom. You know, he doesn't come up with something because that's how people do it. You know, exactly. it's like everybody, yeah. everybody does it this way. He doesn't care about that. He's a free thinker. Yeah. Well, I actually can see, I actually, in my own mind, use the word genius. Um, and I sort of decided that's really what genius is. It's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily really being smart the way we think of it. Like, you know, having all these facts on your, on your, on your, on the tip of your fingers or, or whatever, but it's someone who just can sit with it and go, okay, 
free my mind, free thinking is a great, great word, just free myself of any expectations or, 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 you know, how this should be done and just get in there and, and do it. Now, I'm not that way. I, I really, I, I tend to be someone who looks at, I'm inspired by how other people do things. So when I, so when Jim Henson did the Muppets, I, I just thought that was fantastic. I love the idea that they could make create characters out of little pieces of foam and stuff. And so I wanted to do that, but I really wasn't inventing it. I was just, I was really copying it and I made my own characters, of course. So I, my creativity was in the implementation of that um, and the characters, but it wasn't the idea of it was, I was learning how they did it and then copying that. And Chuck just kind of, he didn't care. He just did it. He didn't care about what other people said was the right way to do things. And I think that, that and we all benefited from his, his brilliance and his, and his genius in that way. Absolutely. And um, I think if it, Chuck hadn't been that way, he couldn't possibly have come up, with, maybe with Forth, maybe somebody else could have come up with Forth, but nobody else could have come up with Color Forth. It is so out of the box. It's it's painful, but it's beautiful as well. It's an extraordinary thing. Albert van der Horst, are you going to say something? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, what I was most impressed with, the, one of the pieces of code I was most impressed with, and it's related to Meta Tool lecture, is the basic compiler published in uh, four dimensions and I have reworked it and I think that what is especially brilliant is the use of uh, separate word lists or glossaries and now you've got vocabularies. Uh, I wonder whether the people who are here, uh, very old hands with a lot of uh, knowledge of uh, what happened. If uh, what is published in four dimensions is the original, or that the original was indeed written by uh, uh, Chuck Moore himself, and whether that is uh, somewhere available for study. That's a question to everybody, in fact, but Leo Barbie and Special. I don't. I don't know. I don't remember that article. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, Michel, uh, Pro Professor Michel from Rio de Janeiro. Are you here in the meeting? Do you want to say hello to Leo? Michel, are you here? What do you what? care? What other Late. people think? So Richard Feynman wrote a book called What Do You Care What Other People Think? I never heard of that. That's cool. Hi, Leo. This is Christian from Canada. Hi, Christian. I wanted to prove that the fort still exists even in Canada and even in Quebec where we speak French. <laughs> so you're <laughs> the proof? Nation for me to learn English. When I was in college, I studied in French and I studied technology and I learned program. I, I developed my interest for programming when I saw the Byte magazine on Fort. And then I got your book and I got involved with programming. But all of this contributed to me learning English and being able to talk to you today. So thanks. Thanks for writing this book, motivating me in school, and also try to try to keep on writing. You're so good at it. And one more thing, thanks for being the written word of Charles, of Chuck Moore. The scribe, because yeah. He was, he's so hard to understand when he explains it himself. <laughs> fast, he's quick. And he's got a mind that has a picture, and we don't have the picture in our mind when he talks. <laughs> That's right. Well, merci for your kind of words. C'est un plaisir.
Um, this is uh, John Helmers from Minnesota, and I had a question about uh, starting forth. The yeah. example, th um, example about the concrete mix. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that really hooked me. I was a young civil engineer at the time when I bought this book, and um, that that kind of cemented it for me. Um, so how? To speak. Yeah, so to speak. How uh, did you come up with that one, or was that uh, one of the programmers? No, that was that was one that for sure is one I remembered. They gave. I think Elizabeth gave that to me, or someone. Uh, it was actually a. It was actually something that they had to solve, um, for some project that they were doing. And so I don't, yeah, it, it was a, it was a great example. I can't remember what it was showing right now, but I, I just glommed onto that one and it was towards the back of the book. Yeah. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't come up with that one. Yeah. The, the, the unique thing for me was it, it made me click in my mind about, uh, you don't have to do everything in decimal. You know, it was, it was an integer calculation of something right. that needed more precision and, and the technique that was used was eye opening for me. So that, uh, that helped me throughout my career. Yeah. Well, again, that goes to, to what I say I was lucky because uh, I was lucky to be working there and, um, and have access to that because I would not have been able to think of an example that good to show the, how you could use a, a ratios with, two numbers instead of a floating point that's how you know it's normal normally people physicists would think that way so ricardo is here ricardo where are you i think he greg? had raised his hand and so yeah greg greg can you hear me uh, yeah, you're you're not close to your microphone, but I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I was fiddling with it. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, thank you for the books. Uh, I actually stole your book. <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, I appropriated it from my first employer. We 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 got your book in, and there was some interest in using Forth because we were developing automation systems using PDP-11 assembly language. And uh, unfortunately, there were other corporate pressures which dominated so that it never really caught on. But, you know, uh, I still have that copy. So uh, Well, good, because the company didn't deserve to have that book. So you <laughs> And I bought several of those. I, I <laughs> so I paid for them uh, myself. And, and actually, when I got the book, it motivated me to try to write my own fourth. And so over the years, I've I've done that a few times, but that's what really started me. That in the Byte article. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, um, so do you have um, an Ant Min and an Uncle Max? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, again, that's just wordplay. <laughs> but know, it was, it's I interesting. Know. It was interesting because um, Chuck's wife's name was Min. She was really a oh, sweet lady. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and so, uh, but it wasn't, you know, that was just, again, it was just a word play joke. Yeah, I, I, I'm just kidding. I know you know they that. Seem but, like you know. Very, they seem like very nice people. I nice would love people. To meet them. But yeah. actually, uh, my real question is, I, I don't know if you've um, kept up to date on modern uh, programming trends and, and practices at all. You know, if you had any thoughts on things like, for example, uh, the recent resurgence of functional programming or you know, any thoughts on the way software development is going these days? Uh, uh, you know, not at the moment. When I was around in the early 90s, um, I was doing program management for tech companies in Seattle. And so software development methodologies, agile and those kinds of things, I, I, did, I did study those. Um, but it was more about, you know, like running a running a software development team kind of thing more than the um you know more like the life cycle of, of software development rather than specific techniques and since then i haven't paid attention at all i do like i mentioned before i do all the work that i'm doing now in php with mysql and some javascript and uh, jquery and then mysql did i already say that um and some Apache front end, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, and since I've never worked 
in that capacity, I've done all this work on my own. Uh, it's my wife's company and I'm the only, I'm the entire technical staff and QA and everything else. So nobody in the company really knows. I'm really on my own. Uh, and so I, ha I kind of developed over the years my own way of doing PHP. And I think if I were ever to like uh, have somebody else work for the company and look at my code, they would probably go, what, what is this guy doing? You know, <laughs> but I came with ways of, you know, factoring stuff out so that you could maintain it. That to, to me, that's the most important thing is be able to maintain the code. So I, I think I'm in my own world here, honestly, when it comes to that stuff. I just do, I'm just doing what, what makes sense to me. Right, that's very different than being on an agile team. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, well, but the, the yeah. stuff, the, it's the nice. agile stuff, the agile, I mean, I think a lot of the way Chuck worked was, was agile. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that stuff really totally made sense with what I knew from, from Fourth Inc. Mm -hmm. Can I just I, I make was... a comment? Sorry, sorry after you. Um... Oh, sorry, sorry, just just make a, a oh. quick comment. That a couple of years ago, I um, I helped my wife with her work programming in PHP, and I found that I could program in a forthright way in PHP very easily, and that, that was good more easily than in C or C plus plus or anything else. I don't oh. know why that is, but it, it felt comfortable. For, for Did you like work. writing short, short, short functions and that kind of? Yeah, thing? short functions. You can organize yeah. it in the same way that you, you organize yeah. forth. And uh, um, obviously, you can't pass things on the stack, but um, you're 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 calling high level routines, so you don't need to pass that much pointers to something else or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Interesting. Yeah, we, we should we should have a beer and talk about how you do that. How you <laughs> did it. Well, just just to say, were you at the fourth <laughs> Inc. tenth anniversary party in 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 LA? In was it nineteen eighty three? Because I, I don't that, remember. I don't I remember that. I think I met you there briefly. I was the only guy from England there. It, yeah, I just, it's a long know, time ago, sorry. and I, I'm a bit vague as well. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. Anyway, that was fun. Well, nice to meet you again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Just when you when you said we should have a beer, yeah, you know, let's do that sometime. But uh, sure, this might be problematic at the moment. At the moment, yeah, someday. Someday. Look forward to it. Hi, Leo. I I'm Ricardo from Brazil. Can you hear? Oh, me? hi, hi, Ricardo. Yes. Very nice to meet you. I read your uh, Thinking Fort book some uh, long years ago. Well, uh, you know, it was great. It was one of the books that really pushed me forward. So I, I just would like to say my thank you. Thank you very much. Mm, that's sweet. Thank you. It's really nice to hear. It really is. I never mm -hmm. get tired of... You know, I don't know, just be philosophical a little bit, but they say that we never know what impact we have on other people. You know, just, you know, we never know what other people are going through. Um, and we just never know people, people see somebody else doing something nice or whatever, or, or creative or whatever, and it can be inspiring. And the person who did it never knows that. And I have the, the again, the good fortune to, at least in this realm, see uh, and hear from people like you who, can express that and I can hear it. So it's like, well, that's really cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, without thank knowing, you. without uh, knowing um, uh, people like uh, Leo and uh, Chuck entered into my mind and into my heart because he did a creative, so he, he did such a creative work. If you are not touched by this, I think you don't have a heart because it's, we all we all were touched. All all who are in this meeting understood uh, force and the people behind force. Thanks the work of Leo. Cool. Nice to be. Jesus, a lot of I'm enjoying the the comments. I'm not I'm not <laughs> taking the time to parse them, but I'm going to have to before the meeting closes. I want to 
copy all the comments out so I can read them later. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you'll get a lot of people saying that that I mean they add a huge impact. I mean, if fourth does generally, I think on people, uh, even if they end up not using it in the future. But Thinking Fourth especially is one of the books, and other people have said it already that. Um, um, it put together a bunch of ideas that's still relevant today, I think, you know, and a lot of things like, you know, object oriented programming that, that, that allow people to encapsulate stuff that the ideas in that, I mean, people get hung up about a lot of things in, in OO, but the, you know, binding a problem, engineering and software engineering and writing programs is about um, controlling the problem you've got, you know, down to a, and thinking forth, it, it just packages the ideas up very nicely into a, in, into a into an understandable um, concepts that you can give to somebody and go well, look it's it's fourth I know you don't know no fourth but have a look through and and it's sort of to even even experienced software engineers gain something from it I think you know fit thinking fourth especially is a is a real gem as of, of a book and I've seen it said many times so thank you for that thank you Rob it's nice to hear I have another another question if you, if, you, if you'll indulge me. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I know that there's the infamous uh, uh, Eggmaster object, and and uh, I, I know that you've sort of you know had varying thoughts on object oriented programming since then. But um, re regardless, I'm kind of curious what was the inspiration for for uh, for that particular uh, motif uh, around uh, the thing, regardless of what you think of of it since. So I, I kind of remember it, the idea was there's like a, a one one things like it looks like a blender and then it has three it has a switch with three settings on it and it's like but they're completely different things isn't it is that what it is there's buttons to pick what kind of egg but then the the, the caption is oh the, oh oh no oh scrambled. yeah not it's the it's the uh, egg machine yeah I know it's a giant vending machine yeah that's a different I was mixing it mixing it up yeah but the, the, the uh, picture is still relevant. I uh, have been working with the system development kit for the Pico, uh, Raspberry Pico, and it's really that experience. So uh, whether or not it's uh, related to object programming, uh, it is just uh, a very um, pedagogical, uh, that, that picture. I think. Yeah, I think I think it's it's coming back to me. <laughs> I just saw it and it flashed by my eyes. My life passes before me when I flip through the book. Um, oh, it's just it doesn't matter. And, and the washing machine example, Leo, also. Well, the, this what what I oh there it is. This is it. So so this guy it says um, everything you need. So he can he can select all these things fried poached but he can't make it himself right he can't time exactly how how long the egg when it starts to curl and this is just once it just right he can't do it he has no control over it because it's all locked in this machine and it's convenient but i i think i got the impression and this was this was really with you know i mean i wrote this in 1983 or something so it was before i'd ever used i don't even think there were really uh, object-oriented programming language that certainly wasn't like Java came out later. Um, so I didn't really know much about what I was talking about, but I was aware from from people at Fourth Inc. that if you if you lock libraries up in a way where people can't access them, I mean I I do have this experience where you buy um, um, well for example uh, my I'm building the tools that I'm building in PHP are for training, for learning, so that you, you, you get uh, reinforce, reinforcement tools. So you learn something in the corporate environment and then you get to practice it or whatever. And so I'm building those kinds of tools. And there's all kinds of things that are available that you can buy software that you can buy it off the shelf. And from a business point of view, it makes so much more sense to buy something off the shelf than to write it from scratch, right? If the thing, if you can find the thing that does exactly what you want it to do. And that's the problem, I can never get past in this particular environment, I can never see where people are doing building the tools that are doing exactly what I want them to do. So it's almost easier. It, it has been seemingly easier for me to just create the thing and then 
integrate it and do whatever I want to. And I keep having to change it because we change our mind about how it should work or whatever. But you couldn't do that if you bought it off the shelf. So that, that's, that's really the idea that I think that Eggmaster thing is, is trying to convey. Um, you want to, you, even when you write your own code, it's the purpose is not to, because uh, they talked about hiding information a lot. Um, like hiding stuff is a good thing. But to me, that was always kind of missing the point. It's not really so much that you want to hide it. It's that you want to encapsulate it so that it's, you don't have to think about it when you're thinking about this other thing. But you can think about it if you want to think about it. That's, I think that's kind of what I was sh showing that in that silly picture. Thanks for asking so, questions I, like mm -hmm, this, though. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Well, I, I personally want to thank you. My book from the middle 80s, uh, yeah. it really changed my mind on how to write code. Now, I was not uh, trained in a school to write code. I just learned it on my own. And typical of that day was C procedures that just went on page after page after page after page. And when you got to the bottom, you know, 10 levels of indentation. Uh, and once I read your book, I stopped that. <laughs> I started writing shorter routines, not passing a million parameters, and, and things went for the better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I still seem to be, well, in PHP, it took me a long time to learn how to. Yeah, Leo? Kind of a, yeah. Uh, you have a slideshow. Uh, you just begin two slides. Will you please show the rest of it? <laughs> well, it wasn't really meant to be a presentation. It was just, I thought people would ask certain questions and you did. Um, so there's really only one more slide. We Thank have three questions. Okay, this will take a second. Um, I'm gonna mm -hmm. answer his question. Um, let me do, uh, cuss, let's see, from current slide. Okay, here we go. It's on the wrong, sorry, this is so confusing to me. I should know better. Okay, here we go. This is just the only other slide I had. Okay. Not showing right now? No, um, I think, there we go. Yep. Okay, thank you. So can you see that? Oh, this that's gonna be yeah. partly obscured, isn't it? No, um, no, no, it's great. It's great, okay. So I got to work with Chuck when he built, this was the Novix chip um, in the mid eighties, I guess. And um, I can't remember the name of the other gentleman. So I didn't really show him much in this series of pictures, but he was working um, to design this self-contained fourth chip called Novix. Bob and Murphy. Bob Murphy, that's right. Well, I wouldn't have remembered <laughs> that, but that sounds right. Anyway, so I just thought this was a fun, this is the, I don't have many pictures, this thing. I don't have any pictures from my time at Fourth Inc., at least that I, that I can find. But these, I took these pictures um, when we were doing that thing. And so I just thought these were really fun pictures of Chuck. So I just wanted to share that. Because it kind of, you can kind of see his, see the joy that he's, he, he's got. He's just so enjoying himself doing this and thinking about it. It just really captures his personality. So thank you for asking me to show the rest of the, the presentation because it wasn't really a presentation, but that was the other thing that I forgot about. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think Greg, Greg, please go ahead. Let me raise his hand and Greg, do you want to ask your question, please? Oh, sorry. I must have raised my hand by accident. I apologize. I okay, man. Then we have Philip. We have Philip. Philip. Well, I'll, I'll let somebody else speak. But, yeah, Philip. Do you want to? Here you go. Uh, Don's been waiting for longer than me, so I'll I'll invite him to speak okay. first. Don, come on. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, first time I met you, but um, you so impacted my life. I was a hardware guy, and I built my first computer. Uh, the sim. What was it the the simpet i think it was and the cosmac elf and i didn't know how to program so i went to school and learned pascal only only to learn the art of programming and then uh fourth was actually the first language 
I wrote real programs. But before I wrote my first programs, I read Starting Forth and Thinking Forth. And the thing I got out of Thinking Forth was you don't write programs, you create a language to describe your application. And you, you, compart, you um, <clears throat> factor your code, compartmentalize your code, and it's hierarchical in nature. And that, those concepts I got out of start thinking forth, the rest of my programming life, I've used, even in C, I have tons of small C functions. <laughs> yeah. I don't have pages of them. So even in my, in other languages, um, you know, it's been, uh, you know, I put on a, a fourth class here and everyone who is on, um, you know, on the Zoom today, all new programmers read starting forth and especially read thinking forth. It is how to program. And it's doesn't matter what language you use. Uh, the other uh, last thing I want to say was um, I had a company where I had a fourth based robot called Whiskers, the intelligent robot, which I sold into tech ed. And there's probably 50 to 100,000 young kids in junior high and high school that wrote their first programs in fourth <laughs> on that little machine. And I often wonder about the impacts, you know, that, that my little robot, you know, did in their lives. I have no idea. I never hear from anybody, you know, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's cool. So thank you very much for those books. They are fantastic. Oh, great. Glad, glad to hear that. And now we have Philip. Yeah, hi there, Leo. Um, yeah, I'm I'm um, interested to know. Um, actually, just a, a little little backstory to it. My, my first job um, out of university in 1991 um, was for a, a local company that was doing software and hardware engineering. And on my first day of my first job, they sat me down at a desk, gave me a 286 PC and a little single board computer with a Z80 in it um, that were connected via two three an RS232 connector and a copy of your book and said, read that program that we'll come back in a week see how you get on and uh, that 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 um tidied me over for about 10 years i then then um had a hiatus from four for 15 years and then came back to it four five six years ago and having fun with it now actually um, but my, my question is to do with um the, the, those days i suppose really when you were looking at when you were writing those those first two books um chuck's views on fourth and how it should be used quite forthright and as you've mentioned earlier, is, is a free thinker. He, he thinks about what's right for him at that time and doesn't really care what anyone else thinks or, or how someone else might use it in the future. He's doing it for now. And I only read Thinking Forth about a year and a half ago, and it took me right back to 1981 when I first read your first book. And I thought, hmm, who wrote this? Was it Chuck or was it was it Leo? And I was trying to work out, that, you know, because because reading Thinking Forth is actually quite um, – so it's quite a revelation in a way. It's, it's got some very strong thoughts in there. And it, it's quite a hard read in that respect because you have to, it makes you think a lot. It's got, you know, it's got some real gold in it. My question really is to do with, with your thoughts and, and, and Chuck's thoughts. Um, what, was there any point in the time when you, were, when you were writing, especially thinking forth, I suppose, because that's probably after the initial you know, um, great impact to your brain about what Chuck was doing. Do your thoughts diverge regarding what Chuck's thoughts are and what you think, you know, you look at back and you think what he was doing there was not right. I think he should have done this, but I wrote it this way or wrote it that way. You know, how, how was your, your thinking at the time with comparison to Chuck's? Oh, wow. Um, it's hard when you're working with a, with a genius, as you called it, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, yeah. you're allowed your own thoughts. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't say that I ever felt like Chuck was wrong about anything. <laughs> Thank God. I, I just can't imagine that. that. Um, so it wasn't like I felt like I was divergent from him. But on the other hand, I, I do think that I sort of added, a, I added, hmm, um, you, you can't help but add your own take. And you I, added I say, approachability, approachability. Well, that's true. Uh, that's true. I think some people have said that, that, that I was his kind of Chuck's scribe in a way. So I put into words what he probably wasn't bothering to put into words because he didn't necessarily care if other people got it. 
and you know, it's just, I happen to be a very verbal person. I just love words. So um, I think that's probably the, thank you, Bill. That's probably the main thing that, that I did. It wasn't, it wasn't oppositional, right? It was just uh, uh, more, more in a different way than what he was saying. Um, I do, I do remember though, that the, the work that, that I got from that, uh, reading those computer, the computer programming literature at the time uh, that was really coming out of like universities. Um, some of it didn't seem useful at all to me, but some of it did. Some of the theoretical stuff really did. And I, and I think it helped, <clears throat> again, to explain what Chuck was thinking kind of in those terms um, that some of the acad academic people were talking about were using. So yeah, so I don't I don't remember ever having any opinion. I can't imagine where I would think, well, Chuck's just Chuck's just being silly there. <laughs> I don't really agree with him on that. That didn't happen. Okay, no, I mean it's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty much answered my question, I suppose. The reason that question came to my mind is because if you look at if you listen to the how people are talking about fourth now and in the last few years. There's people that think what Chuck did was absolutely right and 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 don't want to deviate from his his practices, but computing itself has moved on so much. And as we saw earlier on in one of the presentations, making fourth work with Java, which which in itself is not new anymore, but it's still pretty it's contemporary and people are still using it in production systems all the time. I mean, I I've I've, I've managed teams that have got lots of Java engineers in. I I can't fit fourth into there because it's not my corporate language. But um, you know, I, I, I it's very different. Um, and now I think that trying to fit forth into, into current thinking is very difficult. And if you use Chuck's thinking now, it's never going to go anywhere. And it, and it hasn't, you know, in that respect, sadly. Um, you have to really go out of your way to make forth fit into, into, you know, corporate thinking these days. And that's not Chuck's thinking. So, so you've got people on different opinions. People say it's pure language. You should think how Chuck thinks. Now people saying that, no, he's stuck in the past. We've got to do different things and have libraries and, and expand it and, and make it bloated, unfortunately. And it's just a way of life. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic that we've got now, I think, with, with all this, you know, how does fourth stay relevant? Yeah, the only thing that, that I can comment that listening to your question is, is that, you know, it, there's always a danger where someone comes along with some ideas and then it turns into a religion or it gets codified and people, people pick some of the superficial aspects of it and they think oh it's got to be this way this is like this is this is how it's got to be done and chuck would never think that way i i happened to watch part of the recording of this this meeting here a month ago that peter posted and there was a lot of conversation about blocks and like it has to be a certain length and 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 it 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 was like i was a little confused by what people were well, people were spending so much time talking about blocks because <laughs> they were just, because it seemed like they were talking about blocks taking up a lot of memory. Um, but they don't, except on the disk, they don't get compiled. So I don't, I didn't understand why it was a big deal. But to Chuck, it wasn't a thing that was religious. It was just, well, here's a very smart way, a really simple way, mainly a simple way to be able to store things on your on your disk, on your floppy disk or your hard disk or whatever, um, without having to have an operating system, and there's nothing magic about it, you know. <laughs> it's nothing, and it isn't. I think I think Dr. Ting said last on the in the recording. He said it's fourth is not blocks, it's and it's not. So I guess that's that's what your question is reminding me of, uh, Philip. Is that. Um, the person who creates the thing, like Chuck, in this case, is never dogmatic about it and would never insist that you do it a certain way. He just he just thinks that there's a in every situation there's a good reason to do it. Nowadays we have we can do our programming on a, on a on a laptop and have a massive file system, and it's no <clears throat> as long as you can compile to an embedded system, it doesn't matter what you're using. It seems to me. Yeah, just, just lastly, a very, very little tiny story about Box. Um, <clears throat> two, two years ago in Euro 4th, 2018, there was a couple of people in this, this room now that were at that meeting. Um, I gave a little presentation on a fourth I was working on at the time. Um, and um, I think there's about 20 people in the room. And I said, how many people here are using blocks anymore? 
and there was one person that put their hand up, and that was Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> he was the only one. <laughs> Why change, right? Well, yeah. I'm surprised he hasn't come up with another alternative yet. Well, actually, he uses screens in color force, and that's, uh, that's reasonable. Yeah. The screens are blocks, yeah. essentially. Uh, one view of a block. Yeah, uh, I use uh, screens as a, a library mechanism, and it works very well. I have one library that works at the same time for Windows, 64 bits, Linux, 32 bits, whatever. So blocks are a practical solution for uh, things. Let me say that. Yeah, I think I, that makes sense. What are people doing t these days with the ESP32 thing? I mean, is it, I, uh, Peter told me that it's mostly hobbyists now that are using it. And, and it's, I, I, I had never heard of the thing before. It's, it's like a super inexpensive. Uh, the, first, the first community is following a development of Brad. Brad is here with Dr. Tim and done and we are following uh, a, an excellent an excellent force and i invite you leo to um, experiment this force with us and talk about in our uh, future meetings or in the force 2020 page probably we can do something with music and uh, force and the esp32 force yeah leo you got to listen to dr ting he, he created uh, some incredible music words. Um, take a look at his um, um, his video, or maybe Dr. Ting can actually do another thing on that. But we're we are also see. I think the future of fourth is very bright. Um, talking about blocks is like you know you're, you're lost in the forest. You know you're lost in the weeds. Blocks is nothing. <laughs> um, What's important is in the future computers, do we want our computer, do we want our AI robots and our computers to incrementally remember things like humans do? Um, do we wanna be interactive with them? When you think about the, the, um, the way that fourth is designed, you know, it's, it's very, it's a kiss, it's very simple, but it's very powerful. No other language today has those attributes. And we're now moving into where we're gonna be working with um, AI and robotics side by side. And you know, if we're gonna build an AI brain, it needs to incremental compile. I work in the space industry and <clears throat> um, we're designing robots that are going to be manufacturing in other planets. I'm just, I'm the computer designer for the company. And um, so they're designing all this stuff in C. Well, you have a communication link that's going out to Pluto and it's maybe a hundred K link. You know, it's not broadband like here on earth. <laughs> so if you want to change the code, just one little piece of code, you gotta, you gotta ship up there a quarter of a gigabyte of code to each robot to up update it. Whereas if fourth is running in there, you're gonna you're gonna update maybe a hundred bytes of source code. So I think um, there, there's a lot of conversation about how fourth is obsolete, it doesn't have a future, and I, I completely disagree with that. I think that you know we've in computer science, the computers have gotten so freaking fast, so powerful, you know, 16 gigs of RAM comes in your laptop. They don't care. They don't, they don't care about you utilizing um, resources efficiently, but then, you know, see you, you, you pull in a library and your code explodes the size of your code. Um, Try to learn C++. Uh, I know there's C++ programmers. Um, it makes my head 
explode. I, I'm a C programmer. I, I write embedded C and uh, C++ to me is a is very kludge machination of if, if you take thinking forth and you apply that to what object oriented programming should be, <laughs> you know, um, so I really think forth has a bright future. We're using the ESP32 as a base. I'm, I'm coming out with a, a new robot um, that's based on the ESP32, which has taken me way too long. But anyway, it's still I'm still working on it. And uh, Brad and Dr. Ting are helping me, and we're gonna we're converting over the the uh, la the language operating system I call the Triune OS from that robot um, to this new one. But um, when I was writing that oper operating system, I always thought. When I was choosing the words, how would I talk to my robot? And so I made it very con conversational, like what you always promoted in your books. You know, don't use some computer ease, you know, wa washer, you know, on, washer off, you know, stuff like that. How would you talk to your computer? So um, I think you would find our group very, very interesting. We're, we got we got to in incredible people every time we have on these zoom meetings i learn so much cool i'd like to add uh, a couple of observations um oh, hi. i've known leo since way way back and i've been fortunate enough to call chuck a friend for the past 40 years and have worked uh, off and on with him during that time the two pieces that um, I've taken, first, Chuck wasn't interested, as Leo had said, of, of what other people thought. He was writing a tool for himself. He was actually pretty amazed when Silicon Valley Fig, fourth interest group, took off with this thing and it just spread. That was much more than he had ever imagined. He was wishing that millions of people would use it. He thought that it would be a, an environment in which actually safe programming could run the tools of war that were being run by very um, buggy software at the time. The other piece is that I have, I've seen, I've viewed this viewed forth as probably the only working class language. Almost all of the other computer languages have either come out of groups or out of academics that have thought about the theory of the whole thing and put it all together. No. Fourth was bottom up and Chuck just worked to solve one problem at a time and things accreted and ideas sort of stuck together. Some were discarded and others were added in. Um, it's a very practical environment. And uh, uh, I've got to, you know, Chuck has sort of become much more of a recluse in the last 10 years and is quietly off doing his own thing again, having abandoned Colorforth and gone on to a whole different area himself. And that's basically what I wanted to add into this group today and pass on. I'm not sure, Leo, whether you've, you've probably not had any contact with Chuck no, over the no. past 10, 15 years, right? No, I haven't. I Thank hope, you, John. I, Thank I you. hope that's that, interesting. I hope that Chuck will uh, share his new ideas, because I uh, I think cover forth is really hard work, and uh, something easier would be would be nice. But I I haven't yeah, well, found anything easier. Yeah, he 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 did actually at Euroforce and also at the SVFIG meetings. He gave talks about uh, his new approach, like the subscript and superscripts and. Uh, so very, very interesting uh, uh, to see. So it's, it's on YouTube. So oh, you I, can must, go I ahead must watch and... the video. I'm out of yep. touch with that. Thanks. Yep. And it's even, Howard, it's even more difficult than Colorforth. 
it's more <laughs> more ideas in one thing for your brain to try to co uh, comprehend. Okay, that has not cheered me up. I've just spent the last <laughs> twenty years grappling with colorful <laughs> so I've got, I've got some somewhere else to go now okay <laughs> the new the new keyboard of chuck is very interesting all all keys are a uh, delete it's all blank a blank keyboard <laughs> well that, that's what we already have in colorful with this little keypad really you can yeah. change it yeah awesome excellent oh i i'd, I'd like to share as well uh what's something uh connected with what leo was saying earlier about uh, Chuck doing his own thing. Um, I had an email exchange with Chuck uh, back, must be 15, 18 years ago, when I was starting to investigate Colorforth, and he had used one's complement uh, <laughs> maths in Colorforth, and it, this meant that um, that his word or was actually doing an XOR or some such. It was uh, very complicated. So I thought this is this is strange. Why is he calling X or, or or the other way around. And OK, so eventually I looked up what this one's complement was all about. And when I found out what it was, that you can have a, a plus zero and a minus zero, it's an alternative way of representing um, values, uh, an alternative to the normal two's complement. I realized that actually one's complement is extremely good. And having just seen about the Apollo computer, I believe that used one's complement because I, I watched that video. Uh, and uh, anyway, sorry, I'm getting lost here. Anyway, so my point is that I first thought, oh, maybe, maybe Chuck hasn't got this right. And then when you dig deeper and understand more about why, then I suddenly realize that yes, Chuck is right. Whether you can apply that these days is something else, but that's, that's, that's some other issue. So yes, I, I always believe what Chuck says. Uh, but what I really learned from Chuck in the email exchange wasn't whether I should use one's complement or two's complement or call X or 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 not. It was I should think about it myself and do whatever I wanted. So that's something I took away from that. Yep. Well, maybe we've got everybody's talked out you guys can move on yeah <laughs> that was really fun thank you very much leo brody for joining us and it's my pleasure I'm very happy to i had the chance to talk to you and listen to all the explanations yeah <laughs> applause applause uh thank you very much and the chat is full of uh discussion and things like uh yeah like that yeah I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna go. There's a little thing you can click in Zoom that saves your chat to a text file. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. I do this frequently, so I get the copy. Well, Peter, thank right. you for thank you for reaching out and inviting Le me to this thing. Leo, you are invited every in every meeting. Please, um, if you find another uh, free opportunity to to share to meet with us, please come, and we are delighted delighted to see you. It was a uh, one of the best moments in the last years uh, for my life uh, to, to see you. And you were an inspiration for me with, the, with these books you, you did. And uh, this nice community we are building, you are a mentor. You are a mentor. You must uh, keep the contact with the group, with the, with the guys here. Thank you. I feel very welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. you, are, you are. Thank you. I'm going to sign off, and you guys can all take another five minute break or whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, yeah. bye bye. Thank you very much for having you here. Oh,